Can you hear me? I hear you great. Can you hear me all right? Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Nice to meet you, man. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so I listened to the new record. I really enjoy it. And I was thinking maybe we could just start there. If you could tell me about the the record and the concept and how it all came to be. Oh man. Um all right. Well, the, the let's see. The record is a trio record. It's um the second with this configuration and with these guys, uh, Mike Baguetta on guitar and um, Jeff Hirschfield on the drums. Um, yeah, gosh. And then, um, I mean, I just, you know, I just love playing with these guys. I, it, it's a challenging uh, instrumentation to play with that, the bass and to compose for these guys. Um, yeah, so yeah, you know, just just to do it. And then we, we did a, a tour this past summer and the music, um, yeah, I mean, it, you probably are aware of this too. Anytime you get to play your music several mm -hmm. nights in a row, it just it, it just lifts up the ground. Sure, yes. So that was, um, yeah, that was really amazing to do that. And then, so after the tour, then we, we recorded another another album. Right, right. So the concept, I, uh, some of the tracks have these poems. Uh, is that, is this your first time exploring doing that? Well, let's see. Um, so I've always been interested in poetry. Um, maybe um, during COVID, mm -hmm. I started taking um, classes, like online, online uh, classes and studying like the mechanics of poems, like formal poetry, meter and rhyme. And um, and it's not it's not so much that like um, uh, you know these poems are like uh, what programmatic or something or that these pieces are you know it's they're more kind of uh, general reflections of the of the poems themselves but um, poetry in general just the you know the way that writers are able to talk about their craft. Mm -hmm. Not that, you know, there's some musicians that are obviously great at it, but by and large, writers um, are able to dissect the mechanics of writing in a way that m maybe musicians either don't or we kind of, um, uh, it's not as granular, I guess I would say. So that has been like, like uh, real mind blowing because when you learn about any other art form, and then pivot to, you know, you kind of pivot to thinking about your own art form. Right. Um, yeah, just, it's like, it opens up avenues of thought that you haven't previously maybe taken uh, taken into account. Sure. And so how did you uh, compile the poems that you were, that you used for the record? What was the process? Well, um, some of the poems, I mean, they're all like really, uh, for me, they just struck me as being evocative poems. Um, most of them are formal poems. So, so that, like they're sonnets in there or, um, and, and one of the, one of the poems is of, uh, a guy I was studying with and he's, he lives in Brooklyn. He's a friend of mine now. Um, his name's Josh Megan and, um, his poem is the hill mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, so yeah, just through studying and kind of um, poems that struck me, and and I was also writing music at the time, and kind of like oh this this like uh, Ricardo the the first tune on the track it has this kind of um, you know it's kind of light it's not too heavy the poem isn't isn't trying to swing for the fences and I don't think that the song is trying to trying to do too much, but hopefully something um, effective. Sure. So yeah. in listening, um, how much of the material was was uh, formally written and how much of it was improv? It's, I could definitely tell there was some structures that were sounded pre-worked out for sure, but there was definitely a, a, a large amount, I would I would imagine, of just uh, of improvisation. Yeah, I mean, I, um, yeah, so th there were tunes, you know, all, all of them had um, chord changes and harmony involved. Um, uh one thing that was kind of different about this i you know i play clarinet a good deal 
Yeah. And um, I, I wanted to try to incorporate that more. Um, and, you know, um, can the can the bass clarinet be a bass function like a bass? Um, so that was interesting. Sometimes it worked. Sometimes, you know, we didn't um, not all the, not everything worked, but it was um, it's interesting to try, you know, new textures. Sure. So, yeah, I was trying to think of other records uh, with that similar instrumentation, guitar uh, reeds and um, and drums, you know, a bassless kind of a group. And I, I really couldn't think of too too many uh, too many bands that have done that. Is there any uh, like what brought you to that instrumentation? Well, I hate to even say it because it's like uh, this band in particular just looms over all, you know, the the Paul Motion trio, obviously. Oh, sure. um, but I was, I was, re I've really tried and, and I know Mike is, um, he's very sensitive about being compared to Bill, Bill Frizzell because he uses pedals and effects. And I know yeah. over the years, people have like, if you use a pedal or something, it's a, now you're in your Bill, Bill Frizzell or something. And right. So, so I, I've really, I, I love, love, love that music. However, it was a very intentional thing for me to not try to write like that. Um, mm. And it's hard because, um, you know, the way those guys play, um, I think everybody in the trio loves those, those players. Um, I think um, there's others. So I, I think Dave Douglas had a, a tiny bell trio, I believe, but yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not, I think that was baseless. Um, there's a trumpet player, Oh, I'm forgetting his name, but he teaches at Indiana now. Um, and he has a, a baseless trio that's that's really good. I forgot his name, but yeah, there, I mean, it's not a, a new, you know, totally new thing, but yeah, but it's 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 somewhat unique for sure. And, um, you know, I definitely think he handled it well, particularly you mentioned the guitarist and his use of pedals. And, uh, you know, it definitely really enhanced the experience. And having those different sounds and those different textures, you know, um, yeah. of course me being a bass player who also plays guitar, but you know, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm always curious to see how they're going to, how someone would handle something without the bass, you know, but, yeah. uh, you know, it did give it a certain openness and a, and a certain vibe that, uh, that was different. And I, and I kind of really dug that, you know? Oh, thanks. You know, one thing about, um, without the, without the bass in this been a learning, learning, curve for me um it at least from my perspective the harmony can't be too complex because without that low low end kind of grounding you know if, if the guitar player is just voicing um dense harmony well then all you're getting is kind of it, it just feels muddy or or, or cloudy or, or or kind of vague you know so um i really found that the simpler I could kind of make the harmony, the mm -hmm. more effective it, it kind of became. Yeah, cool. So let me go back a little, Aaron. Let's, if you could talk a little bit about um, maybe your upbringing and uh, and how you came to, to play. Yeah. Um, I mean, I got to say, um, I, you live in New Jersey, right, Jay? Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, about an hour 15 from the city, maybe. Yeah. Depending. Um, like, I think it's similar from my experience in New Jersey. It's it's similar. Um, I grew up in a public, you know, had a, a, a decently funded public school system, a, a very good junior high and, and, and high school band teacher. Um, my grandparents on my mother's side and my uncle were all musicians. So um, it was just very, I was thinking earlier today, it was kind of like, um, you know, if Spanish were spoken in the house, it, it was just nap, uh, given that music, I was going to take lessons and this was going to, this was going to happen. I didn't, not that I had, um, no talent or anything, but, um, yeah, just so from fourth grade, I, I was taking lessons. Actually, I took piano lessons, um, even earlier than that. Um, and then, yeah, like, um, I had a yeah the, a, gr a great high school band that kind of just spilled into going to college. I went to um, college in Chicago at um, DePaul University. Okay. And just yeah, one thing kind of spills into to another. Yeah. So you grew up in in 
You didn't grow up. Oh, in sorry. City. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, Central Illinois. That's okay. Where I grew up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking at my notes now. Okay. Very cool. So it was was a clarinet first, and then a shift. Oh no. Uh. Uh-uh. I started on an alto saxophone. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I know that's a common thing, um, but I, I picked up flute and clarinet um, later, mm-hmm. later on. Yeah. Right. And then, of course, uh, I, one of the tracks, I, at least one, uh, is the bass clarinet, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful tone on, on the bass clarinet, I got to tell oh, you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks. and I, really, I always seek out, bass clarinet to me is just a, a, such an underrated instrument yeah it's a cool instrument yeah really? yeah awesome so you go to school for was it uh was it composition or just performance yeah i um i think it was called jazz performance and okay. then um so i went to depaul i studied with this great sax saxophonist uh, mark colby okay. that's my teacher i don't know if you ever heard of him but he's yeah uh i mean he's passed he just passed a couple years ago so it's kind of sad but um and then actually, I studied classical saxophone also with a great saxophonist, uh, Susan Cook. Both of them really kicked my ass and and it was great. And um, then I went to grad school in, in University of Miami. Okay. And yeah, I mean, that was that was even more intense. And um, yeah, that was that's great. Gary Keller was my teacher mm-hmm. there. Awesome. Yeah. And now you, you're you live in New York, right? Yeah, and then I moved moved to New York, and that honestly, that feels like going to school again, or some, you know, when especially thinking back, you know, in my twenties, like just kind of like confronting the overwhelmingness of the amount of saxophone players and jazz musicians. Um, that was like going to school all over again, or something, you know. Yeah, yeah. So. Um... In terms of your like influences in uh, in jazz, particularly, who are some of the uh, the musicians you grew up kind of listening to and maybe even emulating early on? Yeah, I mean, there's no uh, like everybody, all all the all the people, you know. Um, but I started on alto, so I was. I mean, I can still sing the Charlie Parker transcriptions that I learned in. Um, Cannonball Adderley and and Sonny Stitt, those were those were my three like I don't know Perfect. trifecta or whatever. Um, and you know Lee Konitz, Paul Desmond, uh, Coltrane, Sonny Rollins. I mean all all of them. It, you know they just all started to um, infiltrate. But you know like funny things too. Like especially when you know you're 12, 13 years old. Um, I remember just loving, loving that Maynard Ferguson Big Bop Nouveau album, and sure. the, I, th- the, I don't know. Do you remember that album? Or you ever? I know that one. With, uh, yeah. with Christopher Holiday, mm-hmm. I yeah. could not. To me, I mean, it sounds silly to say this now, but I, I remember I had a tape with one side was Maynard and one side was Giant Steps, huh. and to me, there was like the same. It was like. Yeah. I mean, but when you're, you know, 12 years old, it's like, mm-hmm. you don't know anything, but. Um, no, that's, that's yeah. interesting. Though. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, Desmond and Konitz and um, I was trying to like, sort of maybe place your sound a little bit with, with somebody uh, of notoriety more, you know, from the past. And I did, I kind of hear a little bit of their influence, I think um, in your, which is a compliment, by the way, I, th- I think they're fantastic musicians, but um you seem to have like a, a specific way of patterning your 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 lines that I find quite interesting, and sometimes it kind of blurs the bar line somewhat and gives it this sort of a a, a, a more of an open sound. Um, is that something that you like actively try to to do, or is is it a concept oh, of yeah. your? Yeah, I should have mentioned this guy. Um, well, a couple things. I forgot. Yeah, I mean, it's been a conscious decision to move move stylistically away from Sonny Stitt and Sonny and, and um, Cannonball. And for all years, I was like obsessed with Kenny Garrett. And like my sound was like really approaching that. But then you hear, you move to New York and you hear a thousand other musicians sounding like those influences. And so you have to do some like soul searching, like, well, who am I, who am I in this sea of things? So yeah, so to go back to your question though, um, around that time moving to New York, I was discovering 
players like Rich Perry was really interesting to me. And like, how, what is going on with his phrasing? You know, how is he able to, I, I, I still don't know, I haven't pinned it down, but I, I call it, he would play under the time, you know, like people talk about playing over the bar line. Yeah. I think he plays sometimes like slower than the, his lines go slower than time, than the, the time happening. Well, that was a real head trip for me to, to think about for a while, like that, and think about what that does, that effect has on the, the music, you know, and, and you think he's like slow or something, but I, I know him and I've studied with him a little bit and his mind's rapid fat, like he's, it's an intentional kind of thing, you know? Yeah. No, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Another guy who kind of came to mind a little bit for me, maybe because of the multi instruments, um, was Jimmy Jufrey. I kind of. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Another one of those guys I think is sort of underrated in a way. Um, I mean, it's weird. I don't know about you, Jay, but like, um, I don't think I, I, I heard the name Jimmy Jufrey, but it wasn't until I was like 30 years old before I like oh, yeah. really checked him out. And I was, I had a conversation with uh, Chris Speed. Do you know that? Um, I know him. Yeah. And, and um, <laughs> I told him that and he was like, you know, I went to school at New England Conservatory and he was teaching there and I didn't, I didn't even study with him. Cause he, Chris, and now he's, you know, he's, he kicks himself for, for not, and you, you would think that, um, you know, they, they would, he would have sought him out or something, but he didn't really know him either. So yeah, totally underrated. Um, yeah. And, and you're, you're right. Like huge influence. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Great. So what's the, uh, what, what's the intent now? Where do you, where do you go from here with this, with this album? Are you going to tour with it? Um, yeah, we got a little tour in, um, in the summer and, um, yeah, just, uh, you know, I, I, one of the, one of my part of the whole thing for me is, is to continue writing. It's, you know, um, I think that that kind of goes with being a, a jazz musician is being a composer and, and writing things. And, um, so yeah, I'm excited about this. We have a, um, I think an eight day tour coming up at the end of June into July and we're finishing up in, in Brooklyn. And yeah, I mean, that's in the near future. That's what, what's going on. Great. And the album will be on all the streaming services and everything like this. Yeah. Uh, May 16th. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'll try to, uh, maybe uh, I'll hold off a little before releasing this until oh. like right before that it might be oh, good. Oh, that'd be awesome. Oh yeah. All right. So, uh, essentially, um, I do a couple of things, but there's two podcasts that I run that are pretty successful. And yeah. uh, one's called the Jazz Real Book. One's called Thirty Albums for Thirty Years. So yeah. I'll uh, we're gonna use it for that. Okay, great. And, yeah, and I checked I, out your. I've checked out your interviews. I, they're awesome. I really oh, love yeah. them. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. So, thanks for I've doing been, all that. Yeah. No. It's, I listened it's, to the um, uh, Bruce Bruce Williams one last night. Oh, okay. It's great. It was really inspiring. Yeah. You know Bruce? I don't know him personally. Okay. Of course, I know who he is. Yeah. Yeah. We used to play together a decent amount. Um, some other names I noticed you, on, on your bio, there's a couple of names in here that are quite interesting to me. Uh, and I want, I just want to ask you about some of your experiences with, with some of these names. So, so, uh, like Rufus Wainwright. Oh uh, yeah. What was, what was your experience with that? Well, let's see. I, I don't like this is maybe 12 years ago. I had a, I had a band with a good friend of mine and this was kind of when he was first kind of coming out, like, um, getting, you know, making albums and stuff. And Dave Douglas released one track called Poses. He, he did a version of it. And I think everybody was like, all my friends were like, oh, that's, that's awesome. So we had this idea of, of trying to just do a whole album or a whole band's worth of Rufus Wainwright music. Okay. And um, so we did that and it was fun. And, and yeah. Um, and then I don't know if this is, has any correlation, but um, yeah, just got a call from a contractor in Philadelphia. Do you want to play the, um, he was doing like a symphonic concert with, um, where he was playing the music of Judy Garland. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. And it was at the Kimmel Center. And um, I played principal clarinet and I think maybe a little saxophone. And it was amazing. And I was able to give him the album afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. And some other names I see on here. Um, Josh Groban. Oh, yeah. I mean, just like, I, you know, like anything, there was, there was a contractor in Philly that um, would contract me for things. So, yeah, I did two like kind of East Coast tours of of him with with his group. Um, but I know, you know, it's, uh, for the horn section, I think he was traveling with like a, a rhythm, core rhythm section and then they right. would pick up horn players. A lot of a lot of those people like Christian Chenoweth and um, they would just travel with a um, with a rhythm section and then pick up the players. Yeah. yeah, cool. Great. So, um, in addition to your playing, what other um, what else are you doing? You do do you teach? I teach a lot. Um, yeah, I play Broadway shows. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, what else do I do? I guess yeah. Um, yeah, I, I do some work with the um, New York Pops. At like outreach programs and sure. yeah you know like mm -hmm. doing the thing you know probably yeah. i i don't know if you're aware but i also have a um it's it's uh it's a well it's a youtube channel where i i interview different musicians okay M much like much much like what you're doing here so um i don't i don't have as many interviews out but um yeah it's it's really rewarding and and i like doing it right yeah i mean it's always a uh it's been a really cool experience getting a chance to interview, you know, a lot of your, a lot of my uh, close, you know, personal musical heroes. And yeah. uh, you really realize that we're all kind of in the same camp, you know, for the most part. That's right. Yeah. That's cool. And, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, again, like, um, you know, like, uh, people have this many times the same types of answer, but, but there's nuance in everybody's answer and and sometimes it hits you and uh, regardless of like i think to myself i man i don't even know if anybody's going to resonate with this interview but me personally uh, like i'm really glad that i was able to have this interview with with this person because um it, it, you know it meant a lot to me yeah yeah i think it it is it's a cool that way and you know, um, and I think it means a lot to the artists too, uh, you know, even though they True. get asked a lot of questions, but it's not always that they get asked questions by other musicians who, who have an under like a little bit of a deeper understanding of what it is to be a professional yeah. musician, you know, because that's pretty much what we're all doing. Um, yeah. When it comes to the Broadway stuff, that's a, that's a very different thing, of course. Um, do you find it, uh, I don't know exactly how to, how to pattern this question. For me, when I do theater gigs, I find them a little monotonous at times. Yeah. <laughs> Being someone who uh, sort of more appreciates or enjoys perhaps doing more improvised music. Um, but of course, as a professional musician, we, we take gigs that we, you know, we're, we have to work just like an actor yeah. has. Um, so can you talk about like the Broadway experience and how it sort of differs or, or changes um, maybe the way you approach things? Well, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. It does get monotonous and it's not exactly creative, but um, you, you, I mean, I love playing my instruments. So um, I'm getting a chance to play. And the, the thing that I do really love also is the, the community, like you, the, the other players are fantastic. So, yes. so maybe you're playing the same thing that you've played a hundred times, um, but you get to you get to make you get to play you get to hear Tony Cadlick play that line again and that's that's amazing you know yeah or just just one example mm -hmm. um yeah the whole the whole you know uh you really have to come in and play it perfect and there's a lot of at least for me it's it can be very stressful as, as a sub you know if it's your own if it's your own show you you're um it becomes very not stressful which is nice um but yeah the sub it, it can be you know you're in the hot seat kind of yeah yeah i've always found the challenge in uh in theater gigs um to to try to play the perfect show you know i mean it's just so <laughs> yeah, many, right and it's it's yeah. it so rarely happens you know so 
and I and I think you make a good point. I mean, it is just such a joy uh, to pick up your instrument and be rewarded for it, either monetarily or just, you know, uh, within your community or the audience res it resonates with an audience or, you know, for some people, especially a show, Broadway show, you know, they might be traveling from God knows where, and that might be their one experience. You know, Broadway. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Very nice, man. So what, um, what are some of the uh, projects you might be thinking like, are you thinking ahead of trying to do something, any musicians you, you hope to work with that you haven't already? Yeah, well, I, it's funny. I, I just had a rehearsal and I have this other, this, uh, well, I have, yeah, I, I don't know how you work, but I always have like four projects in the back of my mind and they're all, you know, in various stages of, um, you know, thought, thought, but I have kind of put together another, um, band and we we just had a rehearsal yesterday and we have we have a, a gig next week um and it's a quintet and it's with two alto players um one of my favorite alto players and good friend of mine um jeremy udin i don't know if you know who he is but um he's really great so it's two alto players guitar bass and drums and mm -hmm. um i mean uh, um yeah so so i've written a bunch of music for that and we're going to do something with that um right I know, yeah i always feel like I'll, I'll write the music we'll do a few gigs we'll see if like we can make it like lift off the ground um hopefully it does but i've had, had also experiences like play we, yeah, we played a few times and uh i just can't i just can't make this like sing for whatever reason and then kind of back to the drawing board yeah yeah it's uh it's always a challenge with this type of, you know, this style of music. I mean, sometimes things just connect and we yeah. don't know, know why, you know, it was funny. Yeah, that's right. uh, um, maybe somewhat unrelated, but I was, I was playing, I just came back from teaching my music appreciation class and I was playing with, for them, you know, Duke Ellington's 1956 Newport concert and, you know, the famous Paul Gonzalez solo. Yeah. Uh, right. And it was like, you know, I was, I was trying to explain to him, you know, Ellington had all this, rich arrangements and all these this beautiful like very nuanced music especially already by that point and it comes down to this one blues bass solo by a saxophonist who was gifted but wasn't considered you know um in, in the category of some of the some of the greats in terms of uh, popularity and uh you know it's just a moment in time sometimes and we don't, we <laughs> don't know how to capture it you know yeah yeah uh, yeah but anyway, I'm, I'm rambling. So uh, anything else, Aaron, that I missed? Anything else you'd like to discuss? Oh, I don't I don't think so. No? Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's a pleasure. Nice, really nice talking to you. And uh, I'm going to keep checking out your music. What's what's the website? Where do we where do people find you? Um, well, uh, Aaron Irwin dot com. Mm -hmm. But also um, the um, interview series is called Thanks for Dropping By. And um, so that's the Instagram. Thank, thanks for dropping by. And I, I think the YouTube channel is called. It's also called Thanks for Dropping By. All right, cool. Well, I want to thank you for dropping by. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Yeah, and uh, keep in touch, man. We'll look forward to hearing more of your music. Oh, thanks a lot, Jay. All right. Have a great day. Take, Take care. care. You too. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.